Good morning. Glad that you made it. Looks like we're still in uh, vacation mood or season. Uh, glad that you're here. Want to thank Iris. We'll be playing some of our music today, so we want to thank Iris for uh, taking care of some of that. Let's spend a few moments looking at our announcements. Uh, reminder that our family lounge is now open. Uh, that is uh, down the hallway. So if you have uh, small children and you just need to like get away. It's really nice. I think it's the nicest room in the church now. In fact, I thought maybe I'll just take it over as my office. And no, just kidding. But uh, yeah, check it out if you haven't already. And you know, if you need to leave with a small one, uh, like instead of wandering the hallway, you have a place to uh, go to. And if you want to, well, I'm thinking about doing something more, ultimately to get like a TV there and cast the service there. Um, but we are on Facebook, so you could even watch the service on Facebook if you happen to be, you know, in that room. So uh, just wanted to enlighten you and let you know all about that. So uh, yeah, we want to thank everyone who contributed to the homeless ministry, uh, uh, peanut butter and jelly. Um, so I want to say thank you from the homeless ministry. And uh, today, reminder, we will have communion. And uh, anyone is invited to communion. You don't have to be a member. It's kind of, I just uh, stand here and you just come forward as you were able. It's pretty intuitive. Um, if there are kids over here, I'd ask, like, don't go over there that way to avoid stepping on a baby or something. Okay, we're continuing our Bible study. Um, doing this every other week on Thursday, so we're going to segue from creation into corruption because God made this beautiful creation, and then because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the whole thing becomes corrupted. So we'll be uh, looking at that this this Thursday, and I'll put it on Facebook also. Uh, here's our sort of our regular schedule, and we put this up in case someone's interested. You can send an email to the office or me or. We can get that to the right persons if you want to participate. Um, upcoming, there's uh, Ann Ash. She's always done this prayer for community schools. That's 6 p.m. on Sunday the 20th. And also on the 26th, there's going to be a community prayer walk involving different churches. Um, you'll get more information on both of these to follow. But it's going to start here at Homestead Park. And it's a pretty long walk. So I talked to Kathy about having a van <laughs> down at the end so you don't have to walk back. So it's a decent walk. So if you're a walker, it's going to be, we're going to go to all the churches working our way, you know, down into, uh, like, I guess, like, lower Hall area, Homestead, or all the way to Homestead. Okay. So that's a couple miles, isn't it? Or maybe more. I don't know. I told my doctor I could walk five miles, so I can't make a liar out of him. Out of me, I guess. Any other announcements that you'd like to share uh, at this time? They did. 60th anniversary, yes. Um, any other announcements? I'm thinking of one, but I, I can't remember. So anyway, so let's, let's start our worship with the opening prayer, and then we'll join together in the call to worship. You can stand as you're able. Generous, merciful God, you invite us to the heavenly feast, promising to fill us with every good thing. Bless these ordinary gifts of bread and fruit of the vine that we may be kneaded and pressed into one holy living body. In the name of the Christ who lived and died and rose again. Amen. O oh God, you sing us a love song every time we gather, every time the bread is broken, every time the cup is blessed. O oh God, sing to us again. Let our lives blossom in your life till the whole world knows your love song. Let us break bread together, 618, or you can follow on the uh, PowerPoint.
Okay, you may be seated, except the uh, children. We have uh, a new guy with us, uh, Jackson. Do you want to come up here? Do you like lollipops, Jackson? And Raleigh and Xavier. I know you're there, but come all the way up here. Are those lights really bright? You're taking your sunglasses on. Is that like you're, you're just uh, being cool, right? Okay, you guys can sit right here. Okay, you can take a lollipop. Take one. And uh, one for Raleigh. And one for Xavier. Okay, so there's a story in the Bible about how Jesus fed thousands of people. Does thousands of people sound like a lot of people? Yeah, it's a lot. And he only had a little bit of food. And they didn't know how they were going to do it, but Jesus was able to make it all work out. And sometimes that's the way Jesus is in our life, when we don't know what's going on, and we don't know how we're going to get through something, that Jesus always helps us to find a way. So remember that, that Jesus helps you find a way. So let's uh, say a prayer together, okay? Dear God, we thank you for all that Jesus does for us. When there is never enough, he finds enough. Amen. Okay, so there's, if you want to go, you don't have to. You can go back to your parents if you want to. But there's a table here if you just want to hang out and play. Charlie, do you want to come up and help them? Uh, no, Jackson, no, no. Okay. So there's like some activity sheets and coloring puzzles, and they can just hang out there if they want to. Okay, so let's uh, worship God now with the presentation of our tithes and our offerings. Gracious and ever-loving God, we thank you that we are able to be here this day to worship you. There are so many other things that the world calls us away to, but we thank you that you have called us today to worship you because, Lord, you are the one who is worthy to be worshipped. As we stand before you, we present our tithes and offerings 
and our very selves. Jesus called us to be a living sacrifice, meaning that we should live out our lives as a sacrifice to you and to your kingdom. And we praise you for what Jesus has done for us as we pray in his ever strong name. Amen. You may be seated as we uh, share in our time of uh, prayer. So um, any prayer requests today? I saw that uh, Victoria's father, who used to be the uh, administrative assistant here, uh, her father passed away, and I think he was 96. So uh, we want to be in prayer with that family. And also, um, Reverend Hartley's wife, Mary Ann, has some uh, serious health concerns. So, but she doesn't want like a lot of people to call her or anything. I was gonna suggest sending a car, but the Harleys are not in our directory. Um, but I think Darlene has their address, do you? And uh, I think Ternace has it too. So uh, maybe others do, but I just, I don't wanna get into it too deep because it's not her wish but she does have uh, some serious health uh, concerns and be in prayer for her. Any other uh, prayer requests? Kathy has the microphone today. Uh, Mimi. Hi, good morning. My daughter Hi. and her friend are traveling to Greece on Tuesday. They're going to several locations, so I would like to pray for their safe journey. I also have another prayer for my son who is in a long time battle with addiction. I feel the Lord is working with him right now, but I need my son to truly open his eyes and see that God is with him and give him the strength to receive help and give me the strength and wisdom as his mom to know what to do to help him. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Mimi. We'll keep both of those in our prayers. I know I've been seeing videos in Greece, like the Acropolis and all. It's just like so many people there. They're saying like they're totally crowded and very hot. I don't want to discourage her, but uh, so yeah, we'll keep her in prayer as she travels there. Travels a lot of, it's a pain in the rear, but it's also, fun. it's like, we all say it's like 80% aggravation and 20% really enjoyable, you know? It's like getting back and forth and traveling on planes and hoping they're not delayed or canceled and all that kind of stuff, so thank you. Any other uh, prayer requests or praises, joys, concerns, whatever you'd like to share today? I wanna give praise that I'm gonna be a great grandmother for the third time. Praise God, yes. My uh, grandson and his wife didn't think they could have any children. And it took them two years. Oh, praise God. Thank you. Congratulations, Nielsen. Any others today? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father God, we again come to you and we pray that you would hear all the things that were lifted up here today uh, for the joys and for those things we need to be in prayer about. Also, Lord, we pray for those who uh, were, are watching on our Facebook or um, YouTube platforms, and we pray that any prayer requests that they have also uh, would co-join with us who are here in person, Lord, and we know that you are an awesome God who does hear our prayer, and so we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join in the Lord's Prayer. So someone mentioned to me that I say the Lord's Prayer too fast, so I'm going to try to slow it down. I'm just like, I'm like fast everything. I just like the, my mind moves quick and I'm all. So here we go. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Was that better? Okay. 
Um, here we go. Our gospel lesson today is from Matthew 15, and we're going to look at, you know, there are two feeding stories that appear in the gospels. The one of them which we're more familiar with is the feeding of the 5,000. And the feeding of the 5,000 appears in every single gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The other feeding is what the feeding of the 4,000, and this appears only in Matthew and Mark, and it's not as well known, or people don't talk about it as much. Um, it's similar to the 5,000, but to me, it's, it's a very uh, different event. So let's go ahead, and we're going to look at the, uh, the account from Matthew of the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them, and the people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days, and I have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And they, in turn, to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magdaben. This is the word of God for we who are the people of God. Let's take a moment for prayer. Gracious God, as we come to the time of message, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us and uh, enlighten us, Lord, and allow us to see your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So do you know, like, feeding large amounts of people at one time is an incredible challenge. Like the, the Olympics that happen every four years, well, two years now, because now they, they alternate the winter and summer Olympics. You go back and forth every two years, but they happen every four years. They used to be all on the same year. But when you have an Olympics, you are feeding thousands of people, and not just athletes, but the media and fans, and, it's an, and they're usually a lot of times in some new place they just built or a remote area, and it, it is an incredible challenge to feed that many people. And to top it off, some of the athletes, you can say you're you know, a real big guy and you're a power lifter or something like that, you may need a diet of 10,000 calories a day. Or you could be you know, a 13-year-old female gymnast or something and they need like 2,000 calories a day. So it's an incredible, one of the most incredible feeding challenges that there is. You know, Jesus faced this challenge at least twice in his ministry. In Matthew 14, we have the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. In Matthew 15, we have the miracle of Jesus feeding the 4,000. But is it really 5,000 or 4,000? No, why? 
Women and children, it's not count. So we're, we're, we're talking about a number significantly more than four or 5,000 because it says they weren't counting the women and children. Um, so in these two feeding miracles, there are several events that are the same or very similar. So in the feeding of 5,000, Jesus wants to get away to a solitary place, which Jesus always tries to do because Jesus never gets any rest, right? The crowds are constantly following him, on him. Why? Because he's healing people. He's doing these miracles for people all the time. So, there, so he tries to actually get away. So in the feeding of the 5,000, he tries to get away by getting on a boat. Now, in a lot of places, um, before highways and even railroads and planes, a lot of towns and cities are built around water for what? So you can have transportation. And it was the same around the Sea of Galilee. The, the Sea of Galilee is ringed with different uh, lake towns. And we see that in the United States, right? Think how many big cities are on a Great Lakes between Canada, you know, Toronto, Buffalo, Erie, Toledo, Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago, and I'm sure I'm missing some. So that's what happened. They were around the lake. So getting on a boat was, beside walking, was one of the main forms of transportation to get around. So Jesus tries to get on a boat. And the feeding the 4,000, he doesn't try to get on a boat. What he does is he tries to ascend a mountaintop. He figures, you know, so he's doing something a little bit different, but he's still trying to get away. The second, uh, some, something that's very similar in these two stories is great crowds follow Jesus because they were in need of many forms of healing. They had many maladies that afflicted them. And the third thing is Jesus had great compassion on the crowds and he would not send them away under any circumstances, right? Like, no matter what, disciples say to Jesus, we got all these people, you know, find them something to eat. And he's like, you find them something to eat. Uh, so Jesus would not send these people away. So in the feeding of the five, th at this point, we begin to see some differences in the sequence of events. In the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples bring to Jesus' attention that the crowds are hungry, they have no access to food, and they should be sent away so they can find and buy food. But Jesus would not accept that. In the feeding of the 4,000, it's a little bit different because now Jesus brings the situation to the disciples' attention. They are in a remote place, there is nothing to eat, and he doesn't want to send the crowds away. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus said, the crowds do not need to go away. You find them something to eat. In the 4,000, the disciples say, where could we get enough food in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Because that's a major concern of the disciples. We have all these people, like thousands of people. And when they traveled by boat, they would go from the populated area to the more remote areas where there were no towns, there was no access to food. So in the 5,000, story of the 5,000 feeding, the disciples say, we have five loaves, we have only five loaves and two fish. In the feeding of the 4,000, Jesus asks, how many loaves do you have? So the disciples don't have to go out and find the loaves and fish. In the 4,000, they already have them, right? He says, well, how much do you have? There's no little boy with, with the loaves and fish in the feeding of 4,000 disciples already have it. I don't know where they got it from. Maybe they are prepared because this is the one that happened second. Um, so when we look at these two feeding miracles together, we find three major themes or lessons. Number one is this. And I think this is the part that impacts us and our lives and the way that we think. The disciples had a credo that was entirely based on scarcity. We never have enough. What are we going to do? How many times do Christians act like that? We can't do it because we, we just don't have enough. But Jesus' credo was always based upon abundance. 
the disciples looked at something and only saw what they didn't have rather than what they did have. In Matthew 14, 17, uh, this is in the feeding of the, the 5,000, they say, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. Because when Jesus went, sent them out to find food, that's all they were able to come up with. Only Apparently this, this boy must have been a boy scout, right? Because he's the only one who was prepared with food. Nobody else had food. But that's all they were able to gather. But you notice how they use the word only. We only have five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people. But Jesus' attitude was what? Five loaves and two fish, great. Just enough to feed 5,000 people. Do you see how Jesus' perspective was entirely opposite of the disciples? And so many times, I mean, how many times in our life? Like we, we live in the richest nation of all time. We have amenities. If you ever have someone come from a foreign country here, you take them to uh, a Sam's Club, right? We'll have uh, Carol give an escort at Sam's Club. Um, so they are totally amazed. You know, I, uh, I'm, I don't have it, it's not 100% nailed down, but I'm considering uh, going on a mission trip to Guatemala later this fall and uh, up with the people who live like in the mountains and e everything. But so uh, Kathy and I were talking about this a little bit and her, um, her sister-in-law, right, adopts these children, one from Guatemala and she shared how, you know, he goes into like a Walmart or Costco or a store like that and they're just like amazed. Like it's not like you just have like this one kind of cereal. How many kinds of cereal do we have? A gazillion, right? Like so most places in the world do not have that. So we have no reason to ever complain about it. Like our worst case scenario is way better than the, the rest of the world. It really is. And I, I want to share something. I don't know. Joey and I went out last night. And we saw The Sound of Freedom. And has anybody seen that movie? You need to go see it. It's a Christian-based movie about, uh, um, I think he worked for the Department of Homeland Security, who was rescued ch uh, children caught up in human trafficking for the sex trade. And very powerful movie. And it's real. There are millions of children across the world who are ens enslaved. And it's based upon a true story. And the actor gives a speech at the end, you know, and they even have tickets online for free. Every, it, it, you need to be aware of this. I was up at Eno Conference, not this year, I got a different hotel, but I was in a hotel. I know that human trafficking was happening in that hotel. It's real, it happens right here, it's happening everywhere, okay? So we need to like, be aware of that. And one of the sad parts is that the United States is the greatest consumer of human trafficking, mostly based in the, uh, the sexual exploitation of very young children, right? It's sad. So we have to be aware of that. Um, so with, we have more, we have so much more than anybody else. So when Jesus, uh, was given 12 disciples, Jesus never said, geez, God, I only have 12 disciples. If I could just have 15. Jesus never used the word only. Whatever God gave was more than enough because Jesus' credo was always abundance, not scarcity. And I noticed this so much is about like, well, we can't do it. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough. We always talk in terms of scarcity. We likewise should never use the word only in front of God's blessings. Number two is this theme lesson. Jesus involves the disciples in the problem so they can be part of the joy of the solution. Jesus brought his disciples aboard in both of these uh, miracle feeding accounts, the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000. In the feeding of the 5,000, he says to the disciples, when they want to send the people away, Jesus said, 
They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Where does Jesus put the responsibility on? His disciples, the people, right? He says, you find them something to eat. And when they come to Jesus in the feeding of 4,000, they initiate it and they say, Jesus, we have seven loaves and a few small fish. Jesus asks them, we have some food. How many loaves do you have? So in both of these accounts, Jesus involves his disciples. Jesus in no way is going to let his disciples off the hook. They want to find a problem, then walk away without taking any responsibility. I've been a pastor for a long time. People love to say what's not right. You know what? Then you step up and make it better, right? You step up and make it better. I don't need like just complainers, right? If you have something that God's calling you to do, then step up and do it. Jesus turns the problem of hungry people into an opportunity, a teachable moment. He says, you give them something to eat. Do you know that there's a training manual for the Ritz-Carlton, one of the most luxury hotel chains in the world? Uh, and in their training manual, you'll see this. It says, if you see a problem, you own it. So it doesn't matter, like if you're working the front desk and water's coming through the floor, like as a, well, that's the maintenance department's responsibility. No, you, you know, if you're a maintenance person and someone comes in and says, uh, I don't know where my room is, or you know, then you are to help them, point them in the right direction or point them to the right person if you don't know. If you see a problem, you own it. So, but that's not, this is not bad news. I'll tell you why God works this way. God could do anything God wants to do. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God, right? But he wants us to be involved. The flip side of a problem is that you get to be in on the joy of the solution. What if Jesus took care of the crowd hunger problem alone without the disciples? then they would not be in on the accomplishment, the joy. And one of the greatest things in life is getting a goal accomplished or having that satisfaction of a job well done. And that's the way God works with us. We are to be his hands and feet. How many times do we hear someone say, why doesn't God do something about this? Do you know what? God created us, didn't he? We are to be the body of Christ. That's what the body of Christ is all about. We are to be, we are his hands and we are his feet. So the disciples, uh, so, so he wants us always involved in what he is doing. Now the third area here I want to touch upon um, is this. The disciples forgot what Jesus could do. Don't ever forget what Jesus can do. See, sometime after the feeding of the 5,000, we come upon the feeding of the 4,000. It's almost, as I talked about, I'm not going to repeat here, it's almost the same sequence of events. Some similarity, some difference. But I like to look at this in Matthew because Matthew has this in chapters 14 and then in chapter 15. In, Ma in, in Matthew 15, Jesus says, I don't want to send the crowds away hungry. The disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Now here's the question. Didn't they learn from what happened before when they took the five loaves and the two fish from the hands of the little boy and placed them in the hands of Jesus? So they're, they're asking Jesus, how are we going to do this again? Well, didn't they just see what Jesus did a short period before this? All they had to do was remember what Jesus did before. And that's so crucial for our life. So many times we come across some kind of problem in life or some kind of challenge. And most of us are old enough that we've come across 
probably many different challenges of all kinds in our life. And somehow, God has got us through before. Right? So the same God who got you for, uh, through before is the one who will get you through again. So don't forget what God has done in your life. All the blessings, all the miracles, both big and small. Remember these three things as we prepare ourselves for Holy Communion. Do we have, like Jesus, a, a credo of abundance or one of scarcity? Do we realize that when we have problems, that Jesus wants us involved in them so that we can be part of the solution and experience that joy? And remember also that don't have spiritual amnesia. Whatever God did before, don't forget it because he has that same ability to do it again in our lives. Let's prepare our hearts uh, for Holy Communion. And I like to share different communion services. So I found the Book of Worship from 1964, and I'm going to share uh, this as our communion service today. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, by word, and by deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and the glory of thy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please take a moment for silent prayer as we confess our individual sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to them with hearty repentance and true faith, Turn to thee, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness but in the manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to partake of this sacrament of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in newness of life and may grow into his likeness and evermore dwell in him and he in us. So on that night when Jesus gathered before his crucifixion, he gathered with his 12 disciples and he lifted up the bread and he said, take and eat, this is my body that has been broken for you. And when that meal was over, he lifted up the cup of the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it as often as you can. Amen.
I invite you to the sacrament of Holy Communion, and I will give you the bread, and then we don't have wine. It is grape juice for visitors. Um, so it, all children are welcome. It's up to the parents. And you may spend time at the altar if you wish. And then as you return, you can put your cup on the two sides. If you're going that way, be careful. You have to, it's like Candyland, you'll have to go around the children to get to your destination. Go ahead, Irish, we're ready. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 